it's tonight. It's just a matter of raising. And I'll ask you to come up here, I think, uh, tonight to ask your question for the audience in the hall. So to our speakers, research assistant Vanessa McPherson and distinguished professor Michael Gillings are members of the Environmental Microbiology and Molecular Analysis, brackets, EMMA, laboratory in the School of Natural Sciences at Macquarie University. This laboratory concentrates on the origins and dynamics of genetic diversity and how such analysis can inform conservation, health, environmental management, and evolutionary biology. Most of the core work in the laboratory examines microbial diversity in various environmental compartments. They have used molecular techniques to investigate a range of organisms from marsupials and insects to native and agricultural plants down to fungi and bacteria in soil or water. So um, with that brief introduction, I'll hand over to Vanessa and Michael to tell us the full story. Thanks very much. Thanks so much. And, and thank you to everyone who's joining us in person um, or by Zoom. Um, I'm Vanessa and this is Michael. Hi. And um, we're going to be talking to you about um, fungal biodiversity um, and the ecology, diversity, and distribution of some of the some of the amazing things that we've um, we've uh, explored in the last couple of years. So there are three kingdoms of multicellular organisms. So we're familiar with plants and animals mostly, and believe it or not, fungi are actually more closely related to animals than they are to plants. So often they're um, lumped in together with, with plants, which I take personal offence at on behalf of fungi. Um, uh, not really. I actually only learnt that fact um, a little while ago. Um, but of these kingdoms, um, fungi are the least well described and least well understood. And I mean, if you just have a look at some of the incredible diversity of, of fungi that exist it's it's amazing that these things aren't um explored a, a bit more closely because they're just beautiful and these are all photos that we've taken on our mobile phones in our local area um and they're also really numerous um so it's estimated that there are about six million species of fungi on earth and just to add to that um so in australia our plants and animals are really unique and we we know that to be a fact um, but our fungi are likely to be just as unique um, so this graph here kind of shows you um, the proportions of um, named species versus estimated species in existence of all these categories of um, living things so out of about um say 430,000 plant species on the planet, we think we've got most of them um, sorted out. So we think we've got about 93% of them named. Um, in the animal kingdom, there it's estimated that there are about 8 million species and we think we've got about 25% of those named. Uh, but when it comes to the fungi, we've named about 150,000 species and we actually don't know what proportion of the estimated um, total this is because um, the estimated total is somewhere between um, three to eight million. So we don't even know what we don't know, uh, basically. Um, that's just how many there are. Um, so why is it that fungi are so poorly described? And it's because they're small. They're really, really difficult to see. So in these pictures, that's that's my fingernail in, in those images, which is about, I don't know, a centimetre and a bit across. No. Um, so they're, they're, they're just really, really small. Um, they're also really ephemeral. So uh, this picture here is of the same specimen. This is at, you know, like 6 o'clock in the morning. This is at 9 o'clock in the morning. And this is you know, midday and by 12.01, it's just a pile of goop on the ground. Um, and they're also really, really variable. So 
Um, believe it or not, these three images oh. are of um, three different specimens that are the same species. And Michael will tell you a little bit later um, how we know that that's the case. Um, and the other reason that fungi are so poorly described is because most of them live completely underground as mycelial networks. So just keep in mind that what we're seeing um, above ground are the reproductive structures, kind of like the flowers on a plant. So fungi are really important um, engineers in our ecosystems and they occupy a huge variety of um, lifestyles. So they can be saprotrophs where they uh, recycle um, decaying plant and animal matter. Um, they can be symbionts where they form um, beneficial relationships, particularly with plants, and they can also be pathogens where they cause disease to plants, animals, or other fungi even. So they play a really important role in our ecosystems and they're everywhere. So one of the major reasons that fungi are important is because they form these mycorrhizal networks, like I mentioned before. So when we learn about plants and how they absorb water through their roots. That's true, but it's only partly true. So the reason that trees are able to do this is because of the, the mycorrhizal networks that are underground. And fungi um, actually make these things available to trees so that they can take them up. So fungi provide um, water, they make phosphorus and nitrogen available to their host plants. And in return, they get um, carbon and sugars that the plants make from photosynthesizing. So this uh, interspecies reliance is really quite extraordinary and it's so important and it's why um, it's why ecosystems work. So we know that they're really important because 85% of plants are actually dependent on fungi for survival. So there are some nutritional specialists and um, many of these actually do occur in Australia. So um, there are carnivorous plants that are able to get nitrogen um, from um, insect material, for example. There are plant parasites. Um, there are also some um, plants, particularly in Australia, that are well adapted to living in really nutrient poor environments like proteaceae. So things like banksias, um, they're able to kind of um, make a, a living a bit more independently. Um, but yeah, there, there are a few that are able to live without fungi, but most plants are reliant on fungi. So some of you may have seen um, or heard about this kind of concept before. This is called the wood wide web. So this is um, a model that proposes that plants in um, a forest or bushland are interconnected by fungal mycelium. So the way that this works, so if you've ever been in the bush and you've walked along and seen all these young seedlings popping up and you kind of wonder how on earth they manage to survive when they have no access to sunlight um, because they're being um, shaded by the canopy above them. It's actually because of the fungal mycelium that are connecting them to those trees that do have access to the sunlight. So those trees that are photosynthesizing and making energy from sunlight are able to pass on those nutrients through the fungal networks. Um, and that's how you get um, stability and resilience in ecosystems because your because the fungi are able to um, help subsidize those seedlings in into the next generation. So roots are densely colonized by be beneficial fungi. So basically this um, slide is showing you like different ways that um, this relationship can work. So ectomycorrhizal fungi are on the outside of roots. So this is like an external colonization. Um, and endomycorrhizal fungi, they penetrate roots. So if you look at the amount of fungal mycelium on, on the root tips, you can see that it's just like there's a lot happening there. There's There are lots of um, connections and networks and exchanges happening. Um, and here in the blue, you can see stained up here, there are some storage vesicles. So um, 
These are called arbuscules. So you might have heard of the term arbuscular mycorrhizae, which is basically um, like an exchange organ. And it functions kind of like a lung where there's exchange of nutrients going between. Um, but the, the take home message here is that um, mycorrhizae can colonize inside and outside of roots. And this is really important. So I guess something that is um, relevant to all of us now is the fact that regeneration of bushland actually may not regenerate soil fungi. Um, so you can see here in this slide that molecular analysis of fungal abundance in a range of mine sites that were rehabilitated over different amounts of time. So this study was done in Western Australia. Um, you can see that the relative abundance of ectomycorrhizal fungi um, pretty well for the for most of the sites here, it doesn't reach that original abundance represented by this red line. So the ectomycorrhizal fungi are those ones that are forming the beneficial relationships. Um, however, what does happen is that the abundance of uh, wood saprotrophs, so these are things that are decaying um, plant and animal matter on the surface, uh, these, these types of fungi are increased at pretty well all of the sites compared to that um, original control. So management of native vegetation clearly needs an understanding of fungal diversity. Um, and the fact that regeneration of bushland, you know, might be um, missing this regeneration of soil fungi can, um, it could be a problem. So one example of something that is really dependent on fungi um, is our orchids. So it, for a lot of these species, um, if the fungus disappears, so does the orchid. And um, that's, that's really devastating because there are so many incredible orchids out there. And um, these are just a couple of examples. So um, this, this one here, is called Thelemitra atrax, and we were lucky enough to be able to find an example of this close to us. Um, and the reason it's called Thelemitra atrax is because of the little black fang-looking things, and atrax is actually the genus name of the funnel web spider. So you can see why that got its name. And this one here, Caledonia transitoria, it's, um, it's tiny, but it's pretty well open for five minutes a year. If you miss it, you've got to wait till next year. Um, this one here, Cryptostylus hunteriana, it has no leaf at all. So um, this kind of uh, indicates how important it is for, for it to be um, in close relationship with fungi because it's actually not making much of its own nutrition. Um, it does have a little bit of chlorophyll. Um, you can see the little bit of green here. Um, and these other two that um, I've just spoken about, they actually only have one leaf and it's it's kind of just like a, oh, yeah, I'm I'm mostly, I'm pretending to be self-sufficient, but I'm actually just, you know, stealing everything from the fungi. And these ones, these fungi are entirely parasitic and they don't photosynthesize at all. So um, these orchids are... Um, also ones that you might find if you're um, out in the bush. So do keep an eye out for things like this because they're just extraordinary plants. So these orchids rely completely on fungi um, for their survival. They make none of their own nutrition. Perhaps the most um, outstanding example, and it certainly was a highlight for us, um, was was finding the Eastern Australian underground orchid. So this orchid spends its entire life um, under underground and under leaf litter. So um, it's really difficult to find. Um, and it's one of the rarest orchids in the world. And it's so rare that it doesn't even make the top 10 rarest orchids in the world list. So the the cousin uh, species, Rhizanthella gardneri in Western Australia, does make the list, but this one doesn't. Um, so this orchid um, has an association with fungi, and those fungi are um, associated with a host plant. So you can see that there's this kind of system going on. And when this orchid flowers under the leaf litter, 
it smells awful. It smells like ammonia. But coffin flies think that's a great thing. So they will go under the leaf litter and they'll go and pollinate um, each of these little flowers that you can see. Each of these is an individual flower. Um, and then when the fruit forms, it smells like vanilla. And small mammals like bandicoots or, um, yeah, that they think that smells wonderful. And they'll go and eat that and deposit a little bucket of fertilizer along with the orchid seeds. And if the right um, fungal symbionts are there because the host tree is also in that new environment, then um, this will be able to start a new life cycle. But you can see why it's really important that none of these things in the network falls over because if that happens, this thing can't exist. So how did we get into fungi? Well, during COVID, one of the things that we couldn't do was go into the lab. So we went back out into the bush and started doing lots of field work and surveying um, all of the walking tracks in the Lane Cove Valley. Um, so what, I think one of the best things about that was that it took us back to why we went into science in the first place. And um, we started to ask questions about um, the world around us. And that was that was one of the best things that, that came out of um, lockdowns, I think, because we've been able to maintain that even though we've been back in the labs. Um, so of all the organisms that we saw, we were just fascinated by the fungi because it presented a real challenge to us um, in IDing them and we just were amazed at how few of them were formally described. So here are some um, different fungi that we've um, seen during the time that we've been in the bush. So these are the guild fungi. So these, these are ones that um, are that have the sort of traditional morphology of having a, a cap and a stipe. So they're the sort of ones that you see in fairy tales and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, they're, they're really numerous and just beautiful. These are the wax cap fungi. So they, they're they called wax caps because they actually do have a waxy layer over the surface of them and they're just incredible. So we've had the... Um, privilege of being able to find a couple that are really quite rare. So this one here, um, I think we've only seen one or two examples of, and it's so rare that it doesn't even have a common name. Um, and this one here, um, the Lane Cove wax cap is um, native to Lane Cove. And it's, um, yeah, it's one that, well, it's one of my favorites anyway. So here are all the non-guild fungi. So if they're Wait, spiked. Can spiked, you hear me, Vanessa? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. We, we can't hear you. I think uh, there might be a battery failure. Oh, really? Can you hear us now? If you just give us a minute, we might have to plug it in. It's a bit okay, try it now. Can you hear us now? I, yeah. Yeah. So where did where did we lose you? So how how long ago did the did the sound give out at your end? Oh, uh, it's okay. It's okay. About two minutes. Okay. Okay. All right. So also, if yeah. you guys could right. mute your your um microphones as well, that would help. Because both presenter and Oatly Flora and Fauna Conservation Society, um, you're both not muted. Right. Are you? It's muted over there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but on, on your on your machines. Okay. Oh, it's just the speaker in the hall. I see. Okay, so can you can you hear us now? Yep. Okay. Good. Excellent. We'll just continue from here then. Yep. All right. So it doesn't matter that there wasn't any audio because you still got the pretty pictures. So I'll just um I'll continue on from here. 
So um, these are the non-gilled fungi. So um, these are basically, you know, if if it if it's spiky, if it's stinky, if it's floppy, if it stains, if it's leathery, it falls into this category. So one of the most interesting ones here is this one here, Aceroe rubra. So um, it smells terrible, um, but you might not know um, that it's actually the first species of fungus to be um, named and described in Aust in Australia. And um, it's one of the few cases where um, it was actually introduced to the Northern Hemisphere um, rather than than the other way around. So these are the ascomycete fungi. So these are um, re really, really small and really, really beautiful. Um, just, I just want to point out this one here, um, the bird's nest fungus just here. Um, so these little things that look like eggs in here, they're actually um, the, the spores that will get dispersed when raindrops fall into the little bird's nest and they all pop out and um and uh form new fruiting bodies elsewhere. So these here are the brackets and crusts. So um these might be familiar to you. So I'm sure as you've been walking around in the bush you might have seen um particularly this one here, Tremedes versicolor. Um, so these are all uh saprotrophs and they uh they play a key role in um breaking down um, plant material particularly. So these are the fleshy brackets and these are basically um, a combination between the, the brackets and the gilled fungi. So these are also um, predominantly the saprotrophs and this one here, the ghost fungus, is pretty cool because they, they do glow in the dark and there are lots of um, uh, hypotheses about why that might be. So it could be because they um, are dispersed by something like an, an insect um, that's only out at night. So these are the earth stars and puffballs. Um, you may have seen some of these as well. So these are really cool um, because when they are ready to disperse their spores, they'll kind of expand. And then when raindrops fall and hit, these uh, round parts of their bodies, the spores kind of come out in a puff um, from that hole in the middle. Um, so they they can actually make places look really smoky if there's a lot of them and it's been raining lightly and the spores are all in the air. And these are the earth tongues. So these are really cool. They're also very, very small. Um, these are quite an amazing group. They're, they're just... Um, they make us really excited when we find them, um, particularly this green one here. So if you guys ever see any of them, we'd be very happy to hear from you. Um, they're, they're basically just little matchsticks, but they're, they're actually really diverse when you get down to the, the fine details. Um, and these are um, the cordyceps and the entoma pathogens, which basically means that they are pathogens of insects. So you may have heard of um, the zombie fungus and this, they, these um, fungi get, get their name because they actually, um, when they infect their host, they actually cause changes in the biochemical pathways of, of that insect that alter its behaviour. So, for example, here, um, this, is, this is not a place where you would normally find um, a huntsman. Um, you know, halfway up a tree. And it's because the the biochemical pathways that have been altered have um, caused this spider to climb up a tree in the middle of the day and then bite down. And that's where it dies. And the fungus will um, slowly digest the insides of that um, of its host and it saves the brain for last. And after that, it um, the fruiting bodies burst from um, the body of its host. And then because it has caused the spider to be out in the daylight in plain sight, um, the spores can disperse and that's how it infects the next generation of hosts. So these are all examples of fungi that 
are still in my yet to be named folder. So it doesn't mean that they don't have a name, but it's just an example of the incredible diversity that we have right at our doorstep. And um, all you have to do is be walking slowly and looking closely. And if these are all things that we've been able to find in our local area, just just imagine the diversity that um, that you guys have in your area as well. And, you know, please contact us with, um, with exciting things that you find as well. Um, and I'll now pass over to Michael to um, talk to you about uh, one of our favourite groups of fungi. Okay, thanks, Ness. So as Ness has just told you, during COVID, we were doing natural history and finding all sorts of uh, unusual species in the bush, plants, insects, fungi. And unfortunately, you know, we don't have unlimited time, so we had to choose a group to focus on. And what we chose was the club and coral fungi. And they look like this. You can see why they're called coral fungi. Mm -hmm. um, they include a wide range of different fungal families and they span all of the different fungal lifestyles that Ness has just told you about. They can be parasites, they can be saprotrophs, they can be um, mutualistic symbionts with plants. And so we also realized that uh, a lot of them were hard to identify. And so we started out doing a survey of club and coral fungi. Um, here's just a, a range of the different types that uh, you can see. Um, Ness has talked to you about um, microglossum already, but you can see there's purples and blues and reds and pinks and et cetera. And these are the, all of the photos that you see in, in this uh, talk, we took with mobile phones within about 10 kilometers of Macquarie. So what do you do when you want to study fungi? and identify them and figure out what's a known species and what's an unknown species. Well, the first thing is find specimens. And as you can see, it involved a lot of crawling around on hands and knees in the bush because a lot of these things are small. Uh, we get lots of leeches and ticks. That's not so good. Um, just to give you an idea of scale, this is Romeriopsis crocea. And that leaf there is an Achianthus leaf, uh, um, an orchid. All right with a tiny leaf about the size of a thumbnail. So what do we do? We photograph them, we collect a specimen, we photograph for scale, you can see it here, that's a centimeter across there. And we store tissue in 100% um, ethanol for DNA. And then we also collect a bunch of what's called metadata. So the GPS, the environmental and specimen descriptions. And of course, all of this, all of these collections are done under scientific collection license to show you the kinds of things that we would collect. So we also need occasionally, if you're going to describe a new fungal species, you need to have a physical specimen that's pressed and uh, preserved um, as a herbarium or a fungarium specimen. And these are just some of the specimens that we came back with, which we thought were good enough to preserve to submit to a herbarium. Um, so four different trips, and you can see the diversity of uh, colors and sizes and shapes and all sorts of things. That's great, but in order to tell, for instance, if this thing here is the same as that thing there, is the same as that orange one there, or this orange one here, one of the only ways of doing it is with DNA analysis. And that's what we do in the lab. And so what we do, we extract DNA and then we use PCR to purify large quantities of particular marker genes from fungi. Now, PCR is what they use to diagnose COVID. Um, it's just a way of making lots and lots of copies of one particular gene. We then DNA sequence those genes and DNA is composed of four different components, C, A, T, and G. And when you DNA sequence genes, you just get a string of Cs, As, Ts, and Gs. And you can line those up 
and the more similar the strings of C's, A's, and G's and T's are, the more closely related those two individuals are. So for instance, you can see over here that all of these sequences here are identical. Over here, all of these sequences are identical running down through here, but then you can see that there's a group here that's slightly different, there's a group here that's slightly different, there's a group above it that's slightly different, and each one of those corresponds to a single species. So this is Crocia, the picture that I showed you in the previous slide, uh, Flavescens, later colour, Pulcella, these are all species of Romeriopsis. <laughs> now, it's hard for humans to just look at this pattern and, and draw conclusions, what you can do is use these patterns to draw up family trees. And if you do that, you get this kind of tree where you've got branches that represent individual species. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of different specimens that we've sequenced here. Um, this, but this is this is too complicated to actually go through line by line. So what I'm going to do is just focus in on just this little section of the tree here to give you an idea of what we're dealing with. Okay, so these are two identifiable species of the genus Romeriopsis, Romeriopsis pulcella. Pulcella means beautiful, little beautiful, little beautiful. Yes. Um, and, and it is. Uh, these are tiny. They're only a centimetre, maybe two centimetres tall. Same with Crocia, the orange one. And you can see that when we put our DNA sequences into a tree, here are the local Crocias here. And these are two Crocias from um, overseas. Um, and you can see they're the same species. The red line delineates where um, the height at which species are cut off. Uh, so our, our crocia is the same as ones that you see overseas, but has slightly different sequence. Uh, Pulcella here, again, the same thing. All of our specimens have roughly the same sequence, but differ from those that are found overseas significantly. And then... You can see that there's this one here all by itself. This is an undescribed species. And when we go back to the bigger tree, we find that most of the branches on this tree, all of these, all of those, all of that, and most of this section of the tree are all new undescribed species of this particular genus of fungus called Romeriopsis. So let's just summarize the DNA results for this one group. And here's, here's some pictures of members of this group. And they split into different colors, brown, buff, white, clubs, orange, blue. Um, adding that up, we reckon there's probably somewhere between, what is that, um, 16 and 20 undescribed species. Bear in mind, this is just within 10 kilometers of Macquarie, and it's only us looking for them. We've looked, of course, at a lot of other groups of club and coral fungi as well. And if we plot the results of the DNA on histograms like this, let's, here's Romeriopsis right here. And those two there are Romeriopsis, Pulcella, and Crocia. And all of the rest of this are undescribed species, or species at least that don't have representatives in DNA databases. And you can see the story is the same for all five of these different groups of club and coral fungi. These are identifiable. These are new species. These are identifiable. These are new species. So... What that means is that even in our local area, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of undescribed species of fungi just in local bushland. To give you an idea of what some of these look like, this is another genus. It's a slightly bigger fungus than Romeriopsis. It's about fist-sized, usually, these, these fruiting bodies. 
This is called Romeria. And we can't really put a firm name on any of these specimens. They're all likely to be new species. So the summary of this work is that we've examined 15 genera of club and coral fungi, and each of the, each of the genera contained mul contain multiple undescribed species. And these are all in the local area. Um, whereas the vast majority of plants and animals have all been described in, in Lane Cove, for instance. What this says is that fungi are vastly underdescribed and unknown. You can actually use these data, even though you don't know the species are not named, you can use these data to ask things about the distribution of fungi in the local area. And so all what we're showing here is a map of the Lane Cove Valley. The hatched area is Lane Cove National Park. And the more intense the color and the greater the number of dots in an area, the more fungal diversity there is. One of the things you'll notice here is that there are clear areas of hyper-diverse fungi, lots and lots of different fungi in small areas, but none of those are protected by the National Park. And some of the fungi that we're describing, we've only seen once or twice. And bear in mind, we're finding extremely rare orchids and new um, and, and unusual species of plants. So uh, there are clear hotspots. Uh, in the future, we hope that these hotspots will be used to uh, make decisions about protection of local woodland. Okay, so that's all very well, but we've only been examining fungal fruiting bodies. That is things like mushrooms and toadstools and clubs and corals that stick up above the ground. Most fungi look like this. They're mycelial threads in soil. The um, analogy would be, imagine going out into your local patch of bushland and identifying plants just by picking flowers. You'd miss most of the species of plants because they wouldn't be flowering. Or there would be plants that never flowered, like mothers and uh, ferns and pines and things like that. The same is true in the fungal world. You can't actually do significant amounts of work by just concentrating on the fungal fruiting bodies yeah. as we've been doing so far. So to really understand, understand fungi, what we need to do is to examine all of them. And one of the best ways of doing that is to take soil samples like this and extract total DNA from that soil. So that's going to have the DNA of all of the fungi, all of the bacteria, all of the mites, nematodes, any roots, plant roots that might be there. And then from that DNA, we, we ask the question, what kinds of fungi are there? So why would we want to do this? Well, one of the reasons is that when we've been walking around, we notice that pristine woodland has diverse native fungi like this, these ones here. We know all of these species are ectomycorrhizal with eucalypts. They all form associations with eucalypts. In degraded or weedy areas, we find these kinds of fungi on the right-hand panel. Now, these are either introduced fungi, so they've been introduced from Europe or the US, or they are saprotrophs. In other words, they're fungi that, as Ness told you, that exist on, you know, they break down dead plant material. The interesting thing is, when we're walking through bushland, we can walk through a patch of bush that looks okay, it's not really weedy, but mainly contains these fungi. And we took that to mean that these were regenerated sites, and that turned, it turned out to be true. So our initial observations suggest that 
regenerated areas, even though all the weeds have been removed, do not revert back to these fungi. Instead, they can still contain these fungi. That means that bush regeneration may not regenerate the fungi that are essential for long-term survival of native bushland. So we decided to actually ask that question. Here's the question. What is the fungal diversity in weedy, like this, lots of privet, tradescantius, stuff like that, regenerated, looks pretty good, there don't seem to be any weeds, or pristine areas? And what we've done is we've collected soil samples from along three urban creeks that each span a range of these vegetation types. So along about a two kilometer stretch of um, creek, and here's an example. This is Stony Creek in Gordon, uh, where the flying fox colony is down in here. And each of these stars represents a sampling site. Uh, we start up the top here and every hundred meters, Adjacent to the creek, we take a soil sample. Um, and importantly, this aerial photo is of the same catchment. We know the bush regeneration um, and wood care history of each of these sites. What do we hope to do with this? Well, we are extracting DNA from each of the um, soil samples that we've taken. We then sequence fungal DNA targets from that DNA, and we use a high throughput nanopore sequencing unit. So this is the whole DNA sequencing unit here. It's not much bigger than a computer mouse. And these next generation DNA sequences are simply astounding. You can see the read count on this. This is 2.72 million DNA sequences in five hours. Um, and with this, we aim to analyze about 200 soil samples across 54 sites along three different urban creeks, generating a total of about 8 million fungal DNA sequences. Once we have that, we're going to ask some key questions. So firstly, we will have surveyed the fungal diversity along three urban creeks in a way that hasn't been done before, certainly not in, in Sydney at least. How many species are there? How many of those species are undescribed? We already know how many are going to be undescribed. It's going to be about 90% of what we find. Um, how many species are there? That's a really interesting question that no one has the answer to. We're going to look at how soil properties, mainly phosphorus and nitrogen pollution, affect that fungal diversity. We're going to identify differences in the fungi from pristine areas, regenerated areas, and weedy areas, and we're going to use that um, those data to ask the question, does book regeneration need to consider the soil microbiome? And we think that it does, but this is our way of showing that that's actually the case. And finally, we want to identify hotspots of fungal diversity. We've already done that just by looking at the genera of club and coral fungi, but of course there's a lot more species of fungi than just club and coral fungi. And so we really hope to get an idea about are there real hotspots of fungal diversity? The idea being in the long term at least that those hotspots preserve native fungal diversity and we can use those hotspots to take soil samples and use those to inoculate degraded areas and reintroduce the fungi that should be there. In other words, can these be used as sources of inoculum to restore fungal diversity and potentially bacterial and archaeal diversity as well? And of course, um, little patches we think of Coachwood Gallery temperate rainforest, uh, we know are sites of high fungal diversity. Uh, and these, because they're right next to creeks, are often highly impacted by sewer lines and pollution. Then finally, if you get nothing else from this talk, as Ness has already said, you know, we live in a mega diverse continent 
but it still has lots and lots of biological diversity. And Sydney hosts amazing diversity. All you have to do is walk slowly and pay attention to the small things and you will see things every single time that you haven't seen before and perhaps no one has ever seen before. Um, and that amazes me in a, a, um, a city of 5 million people that we can still do that. So uh, lastly, I'd just like to acknowledge um, people who've uh, identified specimens for us and also other members of our lab, Vahi, Sasha, Tim, and uh, part of this work at least has been funded by the Karingai Council Environmental Levy Grant and the South Taramara Environmental Protection uh, Society. And with that, uh, we will take questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Okay, I can't see any questions in the chat, um, but... We're here and ready for them. Yeah. Someone in the audience? Yep. Okay, So coming up. <clears throat> okay, you'll need to unmute the presenter microphone though. Down the bottom left hand side. Usually. It's just like looking for fungi, just look for all the small things. <laughs> Sorry. Try to... There you there go. There we go. Yep. Okay. It's working now. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jan. Um, Hi, Jan. I actually have three questions. Oh, I have three questions, so you might want to stop me. Um, my first question is whether you are familiar with and have used the work of Ray and Elma Kearney or Kearney. Yep. Okay. My we, second question. Yeah. Okay. Go, Go ahead. On. Oh, yes. We, we've met Ray once at a talk. Um, and certainly we have been to Lanco Bushland Park quite a lot. And we also um, use their papers in our one of our papers reporting on the club and coral diversity in the Lanco Valley. So yeah, we know we know about their work with the wax caps. Um, and for those of you in the audience who don't know, um, Lanco Bushland Park is one of the only, reserves in the world set aside specifically to conserve fungal diversity and it's to conserve the wax caps that Ness was showing you in the very beginning. Thank you. Jan? I was sure you would be, but I just thought I would ask the question anyway. You also mentioned that uh, Rhizanthella slateri is extremely rare. Given how hard it is to find how do you know if it's rare or just hard to find? That's a really good question. So the answer is kind of both. So um, there, I mean, there are lots of um, occasions where we've seen something that um, we we think um, it should be quite common but we've actually only seen it once or twice. And I'm not sure why we think it should be common. Um, it just kind of looks, you know, very generic. Um, but in terms of the Rhizanthella, I think because we know that it's um, the, the way that it survives is so difficult and there are so many moving parts. And if any one of those things that is really specific is not in that 
um, that chain, then it can't survive. So those things we do know. Um, the the likelihood of it being common is is quite low, um, and because it's so um, uh, tightly connected with such specific species of fungi, and which we we actually don't know exactly what they are, um, and because we we have so few examples to go off, we I think it's safe in a in a science way to assume that it's correct in saying you know that they are actually rare so so the other thing that i'd say is is when when we found this what is essentially just two plants within about a couple of meters of each other um that was the first recorded instance of rhizanthella slateri in the sydney basin bearing in mind that the sydney basin has been examined by botanists for you know since banks essentially so since 1770 um now i have to say that subsequent to that it appears that there's another population has been discovered at uh, further north but still in the sydney basin also by an orchid guy who knows what to look for um, and who recognises the, the kind of location that you might find Rhizanthella in, but they're the only two locations that we know about. Along the same lines, um, a friend of ours from Kuringai Council showed us Cryptostylus hunteriana, the leafless tongue orchid. Um, again, the first record in um, in Karinga, I think, and we went, oh, this location, this, you know, vegetation type looks similar to stuff we know about elsewhere. And we just went out and really started looking and found some more populations, um, you know, a couple of valleys over. So it's possible that Rhizanthella is more common than we think, but um, like Ness, I, I tend to think that it's just hanging on by its fingernails and simply because you need five different organisms to all be present for it to survive. And to, to be honest, the only reason we found it is because we were digging around in the leaf litter looking for fungi. Um, so by all means, prove us wrong. And if, if you guys can find any in the area, we'll join you in celebrating. <laughs> and and if you're ever in, in some Coachwood Gallery rainforest and you smell a lot of ammonia, um lift the leaf litter lift the leaf litter yeah my, my last question is and i think an important one you said you wanted to be notified about things that people find but how, could you tell us what what you want to be notified about and that's my last question um look if you see any of the club club and coral fungi we'd be really interested to hear but also just if you want to share with us um because we we know how important it is to connect about the things that you find and um yeah and we're we're always happy to receive photos and and also we've we've seen a lot of weird stuff um and <laughs> we're pretty good at iding things and if we can't id it well that's a challenge and then we will work at it until we can id it um, right at so, the very beginning, um, I remember spending hours trying to ID fungi only to find that they were a piece of string or polystyrene. <laughs> so, you know, I've, I've put in the hours, so hopefully I'll be able to help you. <laughs> Dear. Thank you. Next question. Sorry, just, just while we're on that, look. So this, uh, let's just see. This is, uh, no, it's not going to work, is it? Oh, there we go. No, this is a picture my sister sent from Japan today, which is a ghost pipe uh, flower. That's um, that's cool. Um, so yes, people send us stuff, and uh, we're always interested in seeing anything unusual. Okay, I can't bring it up now, but there's one in the chat from Brett and Deb. Oh uh, yeah, we can we can look at the chat. Oh, uh, I don't no, know that we can. No, we don't see anything in the chat. No, there's supposed to be eight questions, but I can't bring it up to the 
screen. Well, you just read them out and we'll see if we can answer them. Can you see? Maybe if Brett and Deb just um, unmute and ask us. I think they are. Yeah. Hi. Is Deb here? Sorry, I'm eating. Um, fantastic, oh, fantastic talk. Really, really good. Um, Thank you. I, Thank you. I worked um, in national parks and looked after the Lane Cove threatened community of um, uh, Gymnopolis. Um, so it's yeah. great you guys are still looking at that area and finding all that fantastic yeah. stuff. And if you extrapolate that to the <laughs> to the broader environment, like let's say Blue Mountains National Park, for example, mm -hmm. it's just mind boggling. It really is. Um, my question to you is over the time frame. Uh, was the, about the time frame over which you surveyed Lane Cove Creek, given that fungi, fungi won't fruit, you know, regularly and they respond to favourable climate conditions, it's more, I, I suppose it's likely that there's even more fungal diversity present and you were just scratching the surface, basically. Mm -hmm. So so we, um, we spent three years surveying um, lots of areas every week. So... Um, I think it, it it was a it was a fairly robust search effort. I think um, I but as you say, I I do think we've only just scratched the surface. In in the um in the presentation, you'll see a paper referenced, which is McPherson et al. That's Ness here, um, in the Linnaean Society. And if you look in there, it actually details the number of creeks that we walked because we we walked every track on the step maps the, the south tarmar environmental protection maps and we did some 10 15 times um and the total number of of kilometers that we walked is in there and the number of dates and but you are right you know some of these things are so ephemeral and so cryptic that you know, you can walk past them a hundred times and not see them. So um, we are only scratching the surface. And that's partly why going for total DNA from soil overcomes that problem, because even if you can't see it and it's not making a fruiting body at the time, the DNA will be there in the mycelium that you extract from the soil. So we hope that that's going to be a, a more objective measure of the of the total diversity of, of locations. Uh, we will see. And the second part of my question is, are you moderating the fungal photos on iNaturalist by any chance? No. Oh. Okay. No. We we don't we don't have enough time to okay. do, do that. We do we do have a friend who's probably the most. Um, you know, the, the biggest contributor, and she does a lot of IDs. Um, so um, uh, also iNaturalist, I mean, it's a great resource for plants and insects and thing, and birds and things like that. It's not so good for, for fungi. Um, a lot of the specimens on iNaturalist are actually um, not identified properly um, or they're, they're named after northern hemisphere species that are superficially similar but are not what we have here. Okay, so the complexity that's involved um, in looking at them microscopically perhaps to get a proper identification is... Uh, yeah, look, so one of the reasons Ness showed you the, um, the um, earth tones. Yeah. So all of the geoglossum, glutinoglossum, all of those, the only way of telling them apart except for using DNA, is with high-powered microscopy and you need to know what you're doing and know what you're looking at. So it's actually quite labour-intensive and hard to um, hard to do. Um, and and the other thing is that, that um, mycology is not a priority in um, tertiary education anymore. Sure, you know, uh, right. And... And many of the um, great mycologists of the past are either retired or not here anymore. Yeah. So, so you know, we're losing a um, whole whole kingdom of organisms that look to be as we as we learn more and more about them, 
uh, look to be more and more important for agriculture, for native bushland, for ecosystem health. And that that's what what can concern concerns us. Yeah, there seems to be a bit of a, of a revival in um, mycology, like looking at Melvin Sheldrake's book. And there's been a few. Yes. So yeah. Let's hope yeah. that someone sees the sense in studying them again. Yeah. Well. Well. We we hope so. Um, yeah. it, but it. Do you know? Science needs money. And it's very difficult to get money to study to study fungi, unfortunately. Um, yeah. It's just one of those things. Uh, we've had a number of tries at getting funding from even even from granting agencies that are interested in, in taxonomy and, and species identification, and, and it's really hard to get funding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got a little bit of money from Karingai Council and from STEP. Uh, it doesn't actually cover the costs of what we're doing. Um, but that's okay. We do it because it's mm. it's fun yeah. and we, we think it's important. Fascinating. Fascinating subject. Um, we might take – Janine, have you got a question there if you want to unmute? One, one more. No, they didn't do one more. Mm. Sorry, I'll unmute. Uh, yes, hello. Really enjoyed the talk. Um, fascinating. You. And Thank your you. illustrations were wonderful as well. Um, Thanks. My question is, how um, do you envisage or what mechanism would you envisage being a way of reinfecting, to use that term, areas which have been regenerated? What, what can you um, envisage as a way of doing that? So one of the things that we do know is that so with those studies um, that were looking at the mining sites, um, if you just take all of the soil from a from a location and put it to the side, everything dies. Um, so you can't just kind of move everything aside and then hope to be able to put it back later. So the other thing that we do know is that um, seedlings that are raised in a nursery um, have a different set of mycorrhizal fungi that they um, are associated with so that even when they are planted in these um, uh, revegetation sites or um, regeneration sites, um, they they don't actually revert to those original symbionts that they would have otherwise been partnered with, um, which which means that they're not as robust into the into the future and in the long term so one of the ways that we wonder if it might be possible um, to look at is whether we raise seedlings in nurseries with the inoculum that they would otherwise um, be exposed to initially if they were in the wild in a healthy pristine environment but the 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 problem here is that this is an extremely long-term experiment so what you have to have are areas of regeneration where you don't do anything and then an area next door that's, uh, for all intents and purposes, identical, but you plant it with seedlings that have been raised in um, fungal hotspot soil or another section adjacent to that where you actually mix the soil in and then you have to come back in 10 years and ask the question well have the fungi survived does this bush look better than that bush it's it's actually it's actually such a long-term proposition to uh, to try and understand the dynamics of these systems um you know it, it's hard but it's a really good question that question is, is the key question Right. Thank you very much. Um, being as I work with a number of our other members of the group um, in a nursery where we are raising trees for regeneration programs, it's um, quite a fascinating answer. So thank you. Well, look, don't don't stop doing that. I mean, yeah, that's because, right. Because that's, in, that's important. It, and we're really not sure whether what we're saying is true or not. That's what we're trying to find out. We suspect that it's true, but it's only kind of just observational at the moment. And if it is true, it's going to be building on what you guys are already doing. Um, mm. You know, what 
what bush regen has already done to to preserve the environment. This will just be adding to it and helping it to be robust into the future. Okay, Thank you. I think we might call time uh, on it tonight. It's been a fascinating talk, really interesting. Um, you can see your dedication and passion coming through in the extensive hours of science that you've put into it. And uh, it's really uh, is very, very impressive uh, with the work that you've done and the results that you've come up with, uh, but also documenting how far uh, further um, you've got to go. Uh, yeah. It just boggles the mind a bit uh, to think, Miles you too. know, there's so much diversity out there, out there. So um, thank you very so much for uh, presenting tonight. It's, it's everybody's pleasure. enjoyed it. Thoroughly, I'm sure. Thank, thank you, you very much for the invitation. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we'll let you get on with the rest of your meeting. Okay, thank you. Thanks, and you thanks can, very um, much. We'll say good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.